What about, let's talk about supplementation. I've got a bunch of supplements here with me now. And there's so much said about supplementation, but if you were to give me some advice and guide me on what supplements you think I should be taking every day, frequently, versus the ones that maybe aren't so important, but also just like the call outs of, mm. you know, I, I saw this thing on Twitter going viral the other day where someone had screenshotted the top cre creatines on a certain website, and then they had tested them in a the lab and found that a lot of them weren't actually creatine. Yeah in the doses that they'd said and in the form that they were selling. Yeah. So I have this, I now have this skepticism around the supplements I'm taking. I've got some supplements here, I've got some more on the floor. What supplements do you think we should all be taking? And ex explain to me why. For building muscle, the two that rank at the very, very top of the list are gonna be creatine monohydrate or creatine, any form of creatine. There's different forms of creatine, we can get into those. But creatine and a protein powder. And some people, want to argue the necessity of a protein powder. And I guess if you're getting enough through your diet, you you don't have to take it. It's not a necessity. You're not, you're not getting anything magical from the protein powder that you are, um, that you're not getting through your food. It's just that you're doing it at a much more economic cost. If you look at the price of protein these days, I mean, it's, it's certainly becoming a little bit um, <clears throat> unrealistic to think you're going to meet your daily goals. And for me, my daily goal is around... <clears throat> at minimum, a gram per pound of body weight and upwards of 1.2 grams per pound of body weight, if you're active. Creatine has become all the rage recently, it yeah. seems. I was looking it at some be. Google search data, and it shows just how quickly in search volume wow. creatine is increasing from the early 2020s to 2025. Now it's exploding. I mean, and it's been around forever. Forever. And, it been, and, the, and the benefits have been known forever, right? So that's interesting because that's all related to the neurological benefits that creatine is showing in terms of depression and um, degenerative neurological diseases and, and its improvement, its ability to slow, prevent things like uh, MS and Parkinson's and you know, by basically keeping the brain in a more favorable uh, bioenergetic state, meaning being able to, to feed the neurons of the brain um, with the energy that seems to be lacking in some of these degenerative diseases. Also, the other thing that I think has happened, and I did I did a little test in my office a couple of couple of months back, where I asked who in the team took creatine. Yeah, and every hand that raised was a man. Mm -hmm. And I asked the women in my office why they didn't take creatine, and the overarching sort of misconception, which also my girlfriend told me about when we were in Cape Town a couple of years ago, and I said, "Baby, you should take creatine." Yeah. Everyone on my podcast is talking about it, yeah. and she was like, "No, it's going to make me." It, I think she, yeah, she th saw it as like she saw it as a steroid. Yeah, she was like, it's what bodybuilders take. Well, that's going to change quickly because I think that you have a lot of people, highly respected people in the field that are doing the research as we speak in these areas that we're talking about. I urged my wife recently to take to take it. She is chronically sleep deprived because of my boys, <laughs> you know. So she has, um, you know, she has a, a, a definitely operating at a, at a higher stress level. Um, it's been shown to actually improve brain health and performance in sleep deprived and in stressed, high stress states. From a depression standpoint, it's being shown to be uh, very effective, even when kind of paired up with traditional approaches to treating depression through uh, pharmaceuticals. It's just got a lot of promise. And the good thing is that there's really no downside, all right? They haven't really identified a downside to taking it. Um, there's a lot of rumors as to what the downsides are. I actually made a video recently where I talked to them. I kind of addressed head on what they were. Jesse, of course, played our concerned parent who had all the questions he asked. But like, there is a big confusion that people have when it comes to people think it's a steroid. And they think that because the outcomes of taking creatine are it can increase lean muscle. It can increase strength. Sure, because the outcomes are the same as, let's say, anabolic steroid use doesn't mean that the mechanism is the same or the magnitude of what you're going to see from them is the same or even the legality of of the of the supplement itself is the same we're talking about two completely different uh, two, di two, two, two different mechanisms completely and two different things that the body are going to react much differently to when it's an anabolic steroid it's going into the muscle cell binding to antigen receptors that then go into the nucleus of the cell and change gene expression Right, to basically convert, as I did in that video, I said, you're taking an iPad and making it a MacBook, right? You're, you're completely changing what it is. Whereas with creatine monohydrate, you're just talking about providing a more constant flow of energy 
to those muscle cells so that they, they can continue to turn over faster and continue to operate at higher levels of performance. Well, what happens when that when that occurs? You're able to generate more work in a, in a workout by getting more work done. You're creating more of that overload. You're also getting a secondary benefit of pulling water into the muscle cell with the creatine because osmotically when you pull water of uh, anything into the cell, you're going to bring along with it water to kind of keep the concentration inside the cell to be the same. Well, that extra water keeps the muscle cell hydrated, and that's a great thing. A more a hydrated muscle cell is going to likely grow better longer in, in, the, in the long run, just like a flower of water would grow better than one without. And there's lots of different types of creatine, right? There's like gummies now, yeah. there's monohydrate, there's all kinds of creatines. I was, over New Year's, again, I was looking at um, different types of creatine. So I went to the shop, and it sounds crazy, but I bought like 30 types, uh -huh. and I just started researching it. And I realized that there's like a better form of creatine. Yeah. Um, and there's some creatines which aren't so good, i.e. ones that have many things added to them, yeah. um, et cetera. Yeah, it, I mean, creatine is pretty simple. I always present it in sort of two forms to people because there's, a, there's one creatine monohydrate and then there's one called creatine hydrochloride. And the only difference is what it's bound to. The creatine monohydrate is bound to a H2O molecule and the hydrochloride is bound to a hydrochloric acid molecule. And so what happens when that's, ingested in your body is that one's more absorbable than the other. The hydrochloride is more absorbable than the other. So you could take lower dosages of that. The creatine monohydrate is usually taken in a higher dosage. And now there's some new research coming out that states that I used to think that it was just five grams for everybody, mm -hmm. but now they're finding that people that are like upwards of 200 pounds or more, they might benefit from like eight, nine, 10 grams per day. So bigger dosages there and people who are at you know, 120 pounds or so, and maybe some of the females and female athletes, like they might benefit from even just two to three grams of creatine monohydrate. Hydrochloride is usually in lower dosages anyway. So a comparative dose of five grams of monohydrate might equal out to two to three grams of hydrochloride. What's all this stuff about loading? Because when I was younger, my brother was bodybuilding. He would he would tell me that you had to load up. Yeah. I you had to have a huge dosage for a week and then yeah. thereafter go back to a low dosage. It's just, so your body ultimately reaches a capacity for creatine storage. So if you want to get there faster, you load. It's five grams four to five times a day. So a total dose of 20 to 25 grams in a day. Some people are going to find that that's a little bit of an overload for them on their on their gut. There is a byproduct of creatine breakdown. Creatinine is what it's called. We get it measured whenever we get our blood test done. Um, that can sometimes pull along with it some extra water, and that can make you feel a little gut discomfort from that. Again, at lower dosages, if you're using hydrochloride, you wouldn't see that breakdown as much. You wouldn't you wouldn't get as much of that accumulated breakdown of creatinine, so you might get less of that bloating. bloating. That's the only indication why I would ever suggest hydrochloride is if you are some of that 15% of people that have some sensitivity to that. And a lot of times getting around the loading phase and not doing it would bypass some of that discomfort that you feel, that gut discomfort that you feel from taking it. So what happens if you don't load? You just ultimately get to the same capacity at a slower pace. So anywhere from 27 to 35 days or so, you're going to reach that full capacity anyway. If you're taking it because you want to see benefits in performance, like power output and performance, let's say leading up to an event that's you know a competition in four or five days, then you might want to load because you have to kind of get to those full capacities sooner. But I don't really see a need to have to load um, if, again, in the long run, you take away any of those risks, those gut risks, and then you get to that ultimate level anyway. And what about the, the proteins I've got here? Are there any particular proteins that are better than others? I mean, I like to say since that's mine, that's that's better. But the you know the the fact is that anything you can do to prioritize the quality of the protein. So in general, your isolate proteins are going to be of a higher quality than your concentrate proteins. Um, they're still protein, but there's more on a gram per gram basis. Uh, it's ninety percent versus eighty percent um, by volume if it's isolate versus concentrate. So you're getting more protein per 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 volume. But they're not all as advertised, are they? Because no, no. There's I mean look, I, I without I don't ever want to disparage other brands or, you know, I, I don't I'm not in the practice of doing that. But like there are some garbage quality proteins out there that are on the shelves of oftentimes like the biggest retailers. You know, they 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 don't they're they're in it to make money. They're not in it to provide high quality. And um 
again, you're still getting protein, but by the time your body absorbs what's in there, it's netting out to less than what it could be. How do I spot garbage? Uh, I think the best way to spot garbage would be to like, there's something called uh, amino acid spiking. You like people will, will actually include a lot of, um, glycine in their, in their, uh, proteins, like specific, like adding glycine to it. Cause they can get the label benefit of increasing protein content, but it's actually not a complete protein. So you're not getting the actual quality that you would be getting from an isolate protein. What are some foods that you would just absolutely never let go near your mouth? Like huh. The real ones where if your kids asked or, you know, you just say, there's no way we're eating that. I really hate the dyes in food, the food dyes. I think that's a really, um, I'm glad that, that things are being done as we speak to try to eliminate them from our foods. I don't know how our industry has gotten away with it for as long as it has, it, you know, in, in Europe, they've known about the dangers of food coloring and food dyes for a decade or more. And we're still eating these in our foods all the time for what benefit? So it looks more attractive on a, on a package. Like that's bullshit. What about melatonin? I've got a little jar of it here that I found. Um, a lot of people are taking melatonin now and I've got a friend very close to me that's encouraging me to take mm -hmm. melatonin. Do you have a view on it? My view is I, I believe it to be safe. I believe it to be um, helpful, you know, for people that are having a problem establishing a normal sleep pattern. Um, we actually do uh, uh, give it to our children at night because they do have they do have issues with sleep. Um, but honestly, the, the thing that people find to be even more helpful to establishing that normal sleep pattern is that consistency in going to bed and that consistency of waking up. And when you know you're on the right track, you generally don't need uh, an alarm clock to wake you up. If you're doing it right and you're getting enough sleep, you generally see that your body naturally wakes up within five to 10 minutes of the same time every morning without an alarm clock. Have you thought much about how we're supposed to sleep? I, oh, yeah. we talked about lower back, back pains, et yeah. cetera. Is there an optimal way to sleep? Am I meant to sleep on my front, my back, my side? So again, I think this is individual, you know, and again, there's a lot of conditions that can sway somebody in one direction or another. But in general, I think the position that has the less, the, the least amount of negative side effects in terms of how you feel upon waking is to be in what we call the corpse the corpse position, just laying on your back with your arms sort of at your side or crossed over your your belly like this. If you're able to tolerate even more, and kind of up in this position here with your um, with your um, arms. arms up, just because again that actually helps a little bit with some of that internal rotateness, uh, uh, internal rotation tightness that we get in our shoulders that you were demonstrating up against that the wall with that position before. Not, not as big a deal, but you have to understand that. At what other time, really, again, we just talked about being static throughout the day, but at least you're getting up to go to the bathroom. At least you're getting up to go get a meal. At least you're getting up to go take a phone call. When else are you pretty much statically in the same position? And I don't care if you are on your side or on your back or on your other side or on your stomach. You're pretty static for seven, eight, nine hours. There are some effects that can happen to you while sleeping that are significant, like there are times people wake up and they feel excruciating amounts of pain. They did something during the night and they all, I, I must have done something when I slept, right? People say that all the time because they probably did. They probably did. They either stayed in one position for too long and weren't conscious of it, or they positioned themselves over an arm and it kind of, you know, was in this really strange position for a long period of time because they weren't conscious of it. But then there's the sort of chronic effects of being a certain type of sleeper, like a side sleeper, especially some that like to sleep in the fetal position, they, they pull their knees up. It, you, the last thing you need is more hip flexion. It's like sitting, like you're getting from a chair, you're creating your own chair in bed, right? You got another eight, nine hours of being in that position, like lengthen them out, you know, get some, get some flexibility or at least, you know, get some elongation at that joint and those muscles, you know, sleeping with a pillow that is too fluffy, can wreak havoc on your neck. You know, you wake up the next day, most, most of the back pain sufferers you talked about before, 82%, I believe, of people that, re, re, uh, that report sleep disturbance say it's from back pain. And what happens, they feel it mostly, 77% of them feel it upon waking. So like they're not feeling it when they're sleeping, which is even worse, because if they did, they might be able to modify that. They're feeling it upon waking. And it goes back again, what we were talking about um, earlier, 
you see, it, it all relates. You know, like this back pain seems isolated, and we're talking about the thoracic spine, that's back pain, but now I'm talking about sleeping, and that's back pain. Like all these things relate to each other. That's why you have to care about all of it. But it, being in that position is with that pillow up behind your head causes a lot of um, excess flexion of your neck, which can cause issues with the muscles around your neck and with the joints in your neck over time. So you might like to do that, but I'm telling you the healthier position is to sleep with a really flat pillow, a really flat pillow. Um, I myself used to wake up uh, every morning with some degree of neck stiffness. I switched to a, a pillow that is pretty much only about one or two inches high, just enough to support my head. I never have any issues with neck pain again. You're not abnormally propping it up. Not to mention if you have any type of sleep apnea issues or breathing issues at night, the on the back position with the head propped up is gonna be worse because you're closing down your airway a little bit more. You know, there are some cases where, again, that apnea patient might want to be on their side. You know, it's going to be a, it's going to be easier for their breathing. But in most cases, on their back, and also too, interestingly, you know, look, our, most people have tight calves. Right, their ankles are again. We sit all day. We're not pulling our ankles back towards our head. We're not maintaining that mobility towards in our ankle with our foot moving towards our head. Well, what happens in a bed? You get in bed. The, the sheets are kind of tight at the bottom. They're pulling your ankles straight down like that, and your feet are pointed the whole night further tightening those calves because they're just shortening in that position, especially if you trained your calves that day and your muscles repair and regenerate at night. You know, you're basically you're repairing them in the shortened position because your toes are pointed down. I always say if you're going to get in bed, loosen up the sheets at the end of the bed so that you can at least get the ability to move your toes backwards or they're freely moving. They're not being forced into this position. So lots of little tweaks you can make. And some people think they're not as important. I think they're very important given how long you stay in those positions. Never in any other portion of your day do you spend that much time in that position. Jeff, what's the most important thing we haven't talked about that we should have talked about as it relates to health, fitness, longevity, and I guess just more broadly, just living a living a good life? I think that you don't want to stress yourself out thinking of all the things that you need to do, um, because there's many, and in doing so, become paralyzed by an activity and say, I'm not going to do anything at all because I can't do all of it. I think that's one of the biggest things that I see people do is they, they talk themselves out of it from the very beginning because they think that the commitment is going to be too much more than what they're doing right now, too much to ask, and they can't do it. That's, the, that's a mistake. Chip away. Do Make those, we talked about nutrition again, like make that first pass. Take away the obvious stuff. The stuff you know is just not contributing to a healthier life. Then make another pass when you're ready. From a fitness standpoint, get yourself to the gym. Try to do that first thing we said, to take that first action. Get yourself out the door. Get a, a habit of doing that over a period of a couple months. You want to you want to start to adopt a more intense training plan or you want to start to adopt a more intricate training split. Fine. After, don't worry about it. Like the most important thing is to get started and then adopt some of these little things. You know, I'm really noticing that my my thoracic spine is not mobile enough, like Jeff said. I mean, you know, hang from the bar. Do that one little activity each day. Those are the types of things that will pay big dividends when added up. But don't be daunted by the thought that all of them have to be done or you're not going to be healthy. Any investment that you make into your body is going to be a good investment that will pay off, maybe not even right now, but as you started this with the idea of down the road, like you're realizing now at 32, it's going to matter at 52, 62, 72. And so by doing what you're doing now, you're, you're making the right step in the right direction. That can always be intensified as you go. And by the way, your ability to intensify and do more is going to be so much easier than when you've adopted the habit and you actually enjoy what you're doing. And rather than making that big departure from what you're doing now and thinking you're just going to all of a sudden start loving all these things, you're not. And you're likely going to wind up you know, making yourself not want to do it. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor. Become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously. And the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.